Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you everyone for joining us today. It is so great to see that there's so much interest from around the world in today's conversation. In fact, we have nearly 300 people from over 50 countries who have registered uh, to watch this event. Welcome to everyone who has tuned in. My name is Savitra Pandey and I'm the Deputy Executive Director of the Global Center for the Responsibility to Protect. Gross human rights violations often serve as early warning signs of situations that may escalate into atrocity crimes. Yet not all human rights crises indicate such an imminent threat. Nor do all of them necessarily result in the commission of genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, or ethnic cleansing. So what brings situations of human rights violation to the brink of atrocity crime? Do gross human rights violations always lead to atrocity crimes? What can we do to prevent human rights crises from escalating into a situation where atrocity crimes are perpetrated against civilians? And how can we strengthen the United Nations systems, its mechanisms and procedures to prevent atrocities effectively? We hope to answer some of these questions, unpack some of these issues with our esteemed panel of four renowned human rights and atrocity prevention experts. Just a couple of housekeeping rules before we move forward. This event is being recorded and will be uploaded on our website and our YouTube channel. We encourage everyone in the audience to submit questions uh, through the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. When you're submitting your questions, please identify your name, affiliation, where in the world you are tuning in from, and we will try to get to as many of them as possible, I promise. Um, throughout the event, we would encourage you to interact with us on Twitter by tagging GCRTP and by using the hashtag on the brink or at RTP at 15. Before we move and jump into the conversation with our very uh, interesting panelists, I would quickly like to introduce each of them to you. Mr. Andrew Gilmore, currently the Executive Director of Burgo Foundation, was previously Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights at the UN in New York, and also served as Political Director in the Office of the Secretary General. Ms. Yasmin Suka is currently the Chair of the UN Commission for Human Rights in South Sudan. She previously served on the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions for Sierra Leone and South Africa, and as a member of the Panel of Experts on Accountability for War Crimes in Sri Lanka. Mr. Castro Vasamba, an old friend of the Global Center, is currently the Chief of Office at the UN Joint Office on Genocide Prevention and the Responsibility to the Death. He has previously worked as an advisor on the African region in the Joint Office for over 10 years and served as a senior political advisor to the Special Representative of the Secretary General in South Sudan. Last but not the least, Ms. Rita Isaac in the IA is currently the Rapporteur for the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination and previously served as the UN Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues from 2011 to 2017. She's also, and we're very fortunate to have her, is the member of the International Advisory Board for the Global Center for the Responsibility Project. So without further delay, I'll just jump into the conversation. And my first question is to Andrew. Andrew, during your tenure with the Secretary General's Executive Office and as the Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights, you witnessed situations where human rights violations deteriorated into atrocity crimes. Were there any identifiable trends across these situations? And how, from your position in the UN leadership, did you choose to confront these situations? And what political, institutional, and structural challenges did you encounter? Well, thank you very much indeed, Savita, and a warm welcome to everyone who's with us today. So, in answer to your question, I, I would like to mention three examples, um, all, and I'll speak about them for about a minute each. Um, they, they all date from the period 2013 to 2016, when, as you pointed out, I was a political director in the Secretary General's office. Now, I just want to make a couple of points about the context of that time before, because it does explain a little bit. First of all, we had an international situation where the United States was not an unhelpful 
member. On the contrary, it had a, it seemed to make an effort. It, it did not want to see atrocity crimes. And uh, therefore, they were ready to take steps in support of multilateral initiatives that would work towards that end. And secondly, the Security Council was not paralyzed by, it had big differences, not least on Syria, actually mainly on Syria, but on other issues, but it was not absolutely paralyzed on a whole host of issues, as regrettably it seems to be now. And the other point of context is to say that it was in 2012 that the Secretary General re received the report on the atrocities of Sri Lanka and uh, decided on the basis of that just to launch the Human Rights Upfront Initiative, which is vital, to, very vital, important to bear in mind, because that sent a signal from the very top of the organization that the priority of everybody working for the organization should be to work to stop atrocities. And that, that was more important than political expediencies. And even if one annoyed member states in the process of doing that, that wasn't such a bad thing. So that those are two points of context to bear in mind. Now, the first example I want to mention is the Central African Republic. Now there, we in the Secretary General were receiving towards the end of 2013, a number of reports where we, at the time there was a small political office based in Bangui. But um, what we were getting were reports from the various, of, of really serious human rights violations by a number of militias based on ethnic and religious lines. That we really, it was not business as usual. And uh, so what was actually a routine report that was do, a quarterly report to the Security Council on the events there seemed to us something that needed a, a new step. So what we, we had a rapid decision and the, the Secretary General, the head of, peace, the head of uh, political affairs, the chef de cabinet and the Deputy Secretary General all decided that what we would do would be to change the report and send it to the Security Council with a clarion call to them to take action, that this was a clear and present danger to international peace and security and that there was a danger of mass atrocities there. So that actually led to the foundation of the peacekeeping force there, which I, I do believe I mean, for all the problems that are still in the country, it had a, an important effect in reducing the the impending threat of atrocities at that time. Now, the second example comes from almost exactly the same period and is one where two of our, my colleagues on the panel today know more about it than I do. But at that particular period, I'm talking about South Sudan, was the period which um, within only a few months, under two years of uh, the independence of this country, it descended into the selfishness of two men, the inability of two men to work together and their readiness to essentially destroy the country rather than work together led to the perhaps inevitable result of terrible, terrible atrocities. And at that point, the UN, for the, perhaps the only time in its entire history, opened the gates, not of refugee camps, but of its peacekeepers. So tens of thousands of people piled in. Um, it, it, thousands were killed, but I do believe, and, and I have said this quite often, um, that no decision since 1945, in my view, no single decision led to the direct saving of more lives than that. I do think that there would have been tens of thousands of lives extra lost had that decision not been taken. What happened then, I, I, actually, I had been deputy SRSG in South Sudan before, and at that point I volunteered to go, to go and support the SRSG there. The very fact that the Secretary General immediately supported her was a vital signal because the way things work in the UN, things, it was a controversial decision to open the gates and we're still living with the harmful effects as well, because there were negative effects as well as positive. But it, it meant that the backbiting that often happens in situations like this, the undermining of the SRSG that would have happened, I know it would have happened, had there not been a strong signal of support for that momentous decision, I think is very important. Now, the third example I want to use, and it's not a happy one at all, none of them are happy, but at least one in the two actions I mentioned just now, the two event, incidents, um, that it was possible to take action, not least because the Security Council was not divided, though the big powers were not divided on either of those issues. Myanmar was a very different situation. And there, we unfortunately did have deep divisions, not so much in the Security Council, although they were there as well, but within the UN system. Now, the, the, 
this was not bad faith. This was a, a gen, everybody wanted the same girls. Nobody wanted um, atrocities in Myanmar. Everybody wanted to, preferably to support the government, go in the right direction. But there were deep divisions on tactics. And the deep divisions were, should one call out the government for the continued harassment and discrimination and relatively minor at that point violations against the Rohingya, or should one quietly work with the government as some people in the UN system wanted us to do and to take the view that it wasn't the job of the UN to call out the government, because that's not what the UN should do according to some people, and moreover that the development presence should focus on development and try to move towards peace building. Now, what happened there is that it, a few years later, I mean, 2016, 17, um, the terrible atrocities that some people were warning about, including the human rights colleagues, happened. And the, it, all the signals were there. And, it, and in retrospect, it's very clear that the human rights people were right. And, and that it's, actually it's decades of systematic discrimination against Rohingya would lead and the violations and the, and, the, and the actual serious atrocities we had seen in 2012, the fear was that they would re be replicated. But I don't think even those, those of us who really felt that strongly believed that the, it would be on quite such a scale of ethnic cleansing as actually finally took place in August and September 2017. But those divisions, I'm afraid, did paralyze the, um, the UN system, Secretariat and the agencies, because there were deep differences. As I said, the goals were the same, but there were deep tactical differences, which meant that it wasn't possible to live up to the high hopes that human rights up front had engendered on, in that example. So that's essentially what I wanted to say there. Those were the trends. We, in each case, we observed what was going on and took actions, but collectively, the decision on Myanmar was the wrong one. And, uh, and it, that was partly to do with the fact that on that issue, you were going to have China and Russia backing the Myanmar government in a way that they didn't when it came to Central African Republic and uh, South Sudan. Over to you. Thank you very much for that very comprehensive answer and to sort of give us a range of different examples and setting the stage for all of us to dive into this um, in a more comprehensive way. Um, now on to you and, and from your sort of um, intervention, Andrew, the, the next sort of question follows uh, over to Castro. Um, Castro, your office, the Office of uh, Genocide Prevention and RGP is mandated to assess situations around the world and alert the Secretary General to the risk of atrocity crimes. How does your office decide to initiate work on a given situation at what point is a situation of human rights violation given particular attention? Uh, could you answer this question with some concrete examples? Thank you very much, uh, Savita, and uh, you know, thanks to all the panelists. And uh, you know, Andrew there has done a very good introduction on this. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, you know, I, I, I would start off a bit by just saying that, uh, you know, thanking you again, the Global Center, that this is a very timely discussion given the growing intolerance around the world and many parts of the world. And, and, and we're experiencing some high levels of discrimination, hate speech and hatred around the world that, you know, it, it's, it's very important that we do justice to this, to this subject on itself. Um, uh, I, I will, the first point uh, is, is to say is a bit that you know the link between human rights violations and trust to crimes is long established, so that's not debatable. Uh, they are totally interlinked, and, and and as we have just gotten very three concrete examples from Andrew, I want to build on it uh, to demonstrate this very strong link. Um, the office uh, of uh, the joint office in itself was established uh, and in the line of the mandate of the office uh, is early warning and basically asking the Secretary General and the Security Council, asking the special advisor to focus on serious um, violations of human rights law and international humanitarian law that could lead to genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing and crimes against humanity. 
So in that preamble in itself, you can clearly see that if we downstream, if we're not looking at the patterns of human rights violations, then what we are going to end up with is international crimes. So if, if, if you put prevention in that, then the whole focus of prevention should focus on those little things that are happening there before they grow into something bigger. Um, so as, as an office, we have a methodology which we refer to uh, as the framework of analysis. And I will ask uh, you know, uh, uh, participants and everybody to look at the framework of analysis. It has all the risk factors um, that are precursors to atrocity crimes. And of course, one of the most standing out of those risk factors is serious violations of human rights or a record of past human rights violations that have not been addressed. So on one hand, you have human rights violations. On the other hand, you have impunity, the culture of impunity. In such an environment, it's a very high risk situations that could lead to atrocity crimes. How do we finally decide that the situation is tinkling over from human rights violations and abuses to atrocity crimes? In most cases, when this, because every country in this world, they have human rights violations exactly. everywhere. The only difference is that the response, the mitigating factors, what is the authorities doing? But in situations where you see one, very systematic violations, you know, whatever is happening in point A is the same thing happening in point B. And then two, they're targeted. And finally, they become widespread. Of course, once you see that they're very systematic and there's no response from the state or the government itself, is a very clear indicator for you that something bigger is in the making. You don't have to wait for anything else. Of course, we have tools, you know, and Andrew has cited, and I want to use concrete examples. Of course, one thing to do is the secretariat, the UN itself, uh, including our office, is to do certain things. One is early warning, okay, to say that what is happening is unacceptable and we need to start taking measures, you know. This was sounded out by many human rights groups in Sri Lanka, you know, in terms of early warning, in Central African Republic, as, as, as Andrew has said, in South Sudan, in Syria, in Myanmar, in Yemen, all these crises that we have, it was not lack of early warning. The early warning was there because there's a wide recognition that these violations call actually become something bigger. But of course, uh, who's responsible uh, in terms of response? There's this beat that Andrew talks about of the secretariat, you know, like realigning its programs and activities to send a signal that we cannot do business as usual. But, you know, the, the all pillars, all of us, we have responsibility. Sometimes it's easy to refer to the UN and say, what is the UN doing? But the UN is a very big entity on itself. So we have to be very specific in terms of putting responsibility. We have seen a very big role of, for example, the intergovernmental bodies, what the Human Rights uh, Council can do, and, 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 and Rita Izzi and, and Yasmin will do justice to that. And, and various mechanisms through, you know, uh, treaty bodies, independent mechanisms, and, 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 um, and um, you know, the, the, the usual monitoring and reporting itself. We have uh, uh, the General Assembly, uh, of which can actually discuss issues of international peace and security, like we have seen in Syria when there was a paralysis in the Security Council. We have seen the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly stepping up on that. And then we have the Security Council. But sitting back and saying there is a paralysis in the Security Council and therefore there is no response to this is, is not acceptable you know, for you know, atrocity crimes, you know, people losing lives. So we have to look at ways of how to get involved. Of course, we sometimes we go down and ask regional organizations. And sometimes the regional mechanisms have been very effective when we issue these early warnings. Um, and, and we have seen, for example, I have one good example, you know, uh, which I, is rare, is, is the Gambia, because there was a very serious uh, 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 crisis in the Gambia. Uh, and one of the risk factors that we normally highlight, Savita, uh, is, is to say, you see deployment of the military to act against the civilians, 
Okay, so you know when you see this and you see the the the, the government threatening its own people, the civilian population, as it was in the Gambia, it was clearly going to be a very serious thing. The only way it worked was that there was common messaging and 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 and, and understanding that the ECOWAS said this is wrong, and we are not going to accept it. A sub-regional organization was backed up by the African Union to issue a communique saying. We support what ECOWAS is going. We are going to deploy. ECOWAS is going to deploy. We shall support that. And we saw communication from the African Union going to the Security Council, asking the Security Council to authorize ECOWAS to deploy to the Gambia. And for once, the Security Council was very unanimous in taking the decision and saying, we will do that. Of course, there we saw quickly a change of dynamics. Uh, and, and we see the important role of sub-regional organizations themselves. But you can also flip it on the other side and go to South Sudan and the Yasmin can talk about this. And, and you have a crisis that started 2013 already, Andrew has described to us in 2013. But come 2016, again, the same, same violence, you know, same actors abrogate the agreement and go again, start very systematically attacking civilians on the basis of ethnicity. And there you see another uh, you know, dynamic of relying on the regional organizations. You have IGAD that is playing a leading role saying, we got this, you guys don't worry. You know, Troika stand aside, Security Council, we don't want sanctions, we're going to do this. And very quickly, the situation exploded. IGAD is struggling up to today to stabilize South Sudan and fighting for that space to take the lead on South Sudan. But we should always step back and say, is the sub-regional mechanism's best place to do this? Of course, there are good things they're doing, but also seven years of killings is just too long. You know? So we have to think innovative of how we can respond to that. Uh, I will just maybe summarize again uh, by saying, now, what is my role? What is the role of the office? Uh, of course, one is, is to do early warning, as I've said, and we do that quite often issuing advice or notes uh, to the Secretary General and through the Secretary General possibly to the Security Council. We have done this, for example, on CAR in 2013. Before the violence uh, uh, broke out in Bangui, the armed groups in the north were committing very serious violations. And when they were approaching Bangui, they had already taken this identity label of saying and being labeled as an interreligious fight among themselves. And when they reached Bangui, we saw exactly, you know, what was uh, a, a, a armed conflict, fighting, you know, to seize power in Bangui and actually they managed to seize power, but it quickly turned into an identity related, uh, you know, killings with very uh, targeted attacks against civilian populations on the basis of either re re Muslim or, or Christians. Before that happened, Adama Dieng went to, wrote an advisory note to the Secretary General and we shared with the Security Council members what Andrew is referring to, but nobody was willing to say, to, to take on it. Uh, so what do we do? You know, one of the things is uh, Adama Dieng published a very interesting um, uh, uh, op-ed opinion, you know, which was uh, reflected in, 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 in the New York Times actually claiming that there could be genocide that is going to be committed in Bangui. Of course, the UN system was shocked that Adam Adyeng has moved outside the UN uh, system to go speak about genocide. But because of the reports that were there were very worrying and there was a lot of, it generated quite a lot of discussion. Is genocide going to happen in Bangui? Of course, on one side, it kind of polarized action Everybody saying, oh, you know, we are over exaggerating things. But on the other side also, it galvanized the, you know, uh, the international community by saying, look, if you leave the African Union, MISCA, to continue being there, there is genocide that is going to be uh, committed. Bank is being emptied of, of its Muslim population. Uh, so, you know, that early warning on itself was very good. Uh, to generate that action. Same with Myanmar. You know, we have reissued several advisory notes within the UN system to the international community through public statements that what is happening in the northern Myanmar could actually constitute international crimes, including the crime of genocide. Of course, you know, as Andrew said, the division within the sector between the development side, the, uh, the political side, and this building side, they didn't want to hear this. But, you know, at the end, you know, we were, they, 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 of course, 
the special representative was looking for space in Myanmar to try and, 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 and see whether there can be any progress given that San Suu Kyi was, was just coming from detention and taking the reins of power. Uh, but now we can see what the cost is. We are having a, a case, we cannot uh, comment about it, but clearly serious crimes have been committed in Myanmar. Uh, finally, and I will say this, uh, I don't know how many minutes I have, but you know, we all, apart from just saying there is a risk of international crime, we also do concrete things, capacity building, you know, technical assistance, uh, you know, and raising awareness, and of course, advocacy for accountability, because these violations, when there's no accountability, when there's no impunity, you get what you get in car, you get what you get in South Sudan, you get what you get in Syria, because you know what? I can do anything and I'll get away with it. That's wrong. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Kastra. Thank you very much for that. Um, and I mean, you know, with both Andrew as well as uh, Castro's intervention, I mean, you know, it's so, uh, what is emerging, and I mean, this is a consensus with both the, the Petri report as well as the Gert Rosenthal report on the UN's response in Myanmar, is the, the messaging is important. Um, I mean, one of the, the sort of the structural or political uh, you know, blockades in any kind of action is actually the polarization of tactics, the polarization of opinions as to what to do. Um, so, I mean, we have a, a, a very good now segue into sort of the Geneva uh, mechanisms and procedures. So I will move on to Yasmin. Um, and I mean, as we move along, I mean, this is more of a conversation rather than intervention. So, um, I mean, I would still invite either Andrew or Yasmin or, uh, um, Rita to sort of comment on what Castro said or what Andrew said. So, I mean, the floor is open. Would you like to sort of just jump in and so we can put a line under this discussion a little bit before we move forward to sort of Geneva mechanisms? Yes, please, Yasmin. You're on mute. Um, I was going to say that um, what I think it was the report of the panel of experts on Sri Lanka which really, in a sense, highlighted this question of the ambivalence of how the UN responds to certain situations. And I think it was our recommendation that the UN begin to look into how it responded in that conflict, which kind of gave rise to Charles Petrie and, of course, his report. And then, of course, Jan Ellison on the Rights Up Front campaign. Um, but I remember going to CAR, you know, when we were looking at the peacekeeping issue and beginning to ask questions about what had happened to the Rights Up Front campaign and mission. And I think that somewhere there we need to kind of look at how that also fell apart. And really that's about bringing the whole UN system together to look at how one can actually deal with these situations when you're beginning to see the early warning signals. Um, so interesting. And I mean, in the last few months, we've been looking at this question of the Security Council and how it links up really with the Human Rights Council mandates. And I mean, on Myanmar, it was interesting because it did hear from Mazuki Daruzman on Myanmar. Um, and I think that was an interesting moment and possibly more of what we should be looking at. Andrew, you want to jump in? No. Uh, Rita, any, any comments, any observations? Okay, so let me just move on to Yasmin then. Um, Yasmin, you serve uh, as a commissioner in the UN Commission for Human Rights in South Sudan. The commission has a mandate to collect and preserve evidence of alleged violations and abuses of human rights and related crimes. In your work as a commissioner, how does the collection and preservation of evidence of human rights violations differ from that of atrocity crimes? Have you found that populations themselves experience situations where human rights violations are endemic differently from atrocity situations? And do you think, and sorry for my multiple questions, do you think human rights investigative mechanisms act as a deterrent to help, to help prevent ongoing atrocity crimes? Thank you, Savita, and of course, a warm welcome to your audience. I want to start by saying that I think that both human rights practitioners and international criminal law investigators 
share the same desire really to see that those who are responsible for these serious international crimes or mass atrocity crimes are held accountable, but they may have different ways of going about it. And of course, as both Castro and Andrew indicated, South, in, when we talk about South Sudan, we're dealing with a country which since the end of the conflict between the North and the South have been engulfed in a conflict in which mass atrocity crimes have been perpetrated by all sides, including um, the state and its agents, and of course, various opposition groups. And I only think back to, I think it was 2016, 2017 and 2019, when Adama Dieng, I think, um, in almost all of the situations in the, that, those years, raised his concern, really, that what you were beginning to see in South Sudan had the indicators, really, of possible genocide. And I know in 2017, when he made those comments, um, of course, there was a blast across the region with the African Union and IGAD coming down quite heavily on him. And he said that when you begin to use the sort of analysis, you begin to see the indicators there. And so finally, I think on the sidelines of the AU in 2019, he makes the point that it's the chronic lack of accountability, which has really continued to fuel the violence and perpetuate the conflict. So enter 2016, and you have the commission set up and initially its mandate is really monitoring the human rights situation and that in itself was quite strange because already you had UNMIS which did have a monitoring mandate but very clearly the Human Rights Council felt that they needed to make an intervention and perhaps member states led at that time by the United States as the pen holder decided that they needed to set up this commission and of course, the Commission had an interesting mandate looking at both the human rights situation, but also looking at tran the transitional justice mechanisms. And, you know, already in Chapter 5 of the peace agreement that had been navigated in 2015, you have the three mechanisms that the African Union saw as necessary for promoting sustainable peace in South Sudan, including both a hybrid court, um, the question of a truth, healing and reconciliation, Commission and a reparations and compensation authority. But 2017 brings about a considerable change because the violence and the levels of sexual violence escalate to such a degree that the council decides that they need to do something different. And that is when the commission is given this, what I call quite extraordinary mandate of collecting and preserving evidence and in, interestingly, the use of the word related crimes and the identification of those who have responsibility for those crimes with an emphasis on sexual violence and, of course, the ethnic dimensions of the conflict. And suddenly you have a human rights body being transformed into holding both a public mandate on monitoring, but at the same time, a very confidential mandate, which really escalates it to criminal levels of accountability. And for that, of course, the commission's secretariat is expanded um, and we bring on board, I think, the tools which are necessary to do investigations from a criminal law perspective. And that's very different from your normal human rights monitoring, because in a sense, you're going beyond the question of identifying the violations, but really what you're looking at is how do you begin to prepare a basis for future criminal accountability? And that means that the way in which you conduct your investigations are quite different. You're looking not only at the violations, but you're also looking at the dimensions of the, the base of the crime. You're looking at both the context and, of course, linkage evidence. And suddenly you're moving to this question of both individual criminal accountability and, of course, the question of both command and superior responsibility. And that's made for some very interesting methodological changes because to some extent, when we looked at the legal framework, we were also deeply conscious of the fact that we didn't know when this hybrid court would be set up. After all, in 2017, we go to the council and we say that on the basis of what the AU said, we want signature away from the court. 
but that changed quite rapidly with the country being, you know, escalating again into conflict. And that is when I think we also realize that one of the clauses in the peace agreement provides that if you're indicted by the hybrid court, then you can't participate in the political life of the country because you're excluded. So effectively, there was a vetting and screening out clause. And so you can understand that there would be no desire on the part of the political elites to have this hybrid court set up any time quickly because after all, many of them could find themselves out of politics completely. And so the way in which we constructed our legal framework you know, it allowed for the classification of crimes in many different ways, including the violation of treaty obligations. We looked at the question of South Sudanese law itself. We looked at what was happening in the region. And we also began to think about multiple forums in which cases could be brought, either under universal jurisdiction, individuals who perhaps held um, citizenship in many different countries, some of whom had ratified the Rome Statute, and we also began to look at those countries in the region that had domesticated um, the Rome Statute. And you have quite a number of them. So it makes for an interesting environment in which you can act. I think the second, of course, was beginning to I, you know, understand that what we would do would to some extent prepare the basis for um, a prosecutor to begin to think about opening an investigation or even beginning an indictment. And that means that you really had to look at a higher standard of proof than you would normally in a human rights investigation. The other is, of course, this question of the focus on um, individual criminal accountability. And that's where um, I think we began to focus on not just the contextual elements, but also linking the crime base to the leadership structures. And we began to map perpetrator groupings, particularly command structures, also looking at the question of the policy elements, because in much of what we found, the state itself was um, playing quite a big role in the commission of violations over there. And so the commission, based on its mandate, began to identify individuals linked to case studies that we were doing. And in our reports, in the public report, we would put the case studies, but we would not name the individuals, but we kept separate confidential dossiers, which we have completed on more than 113 individuals whom we believe one day would be people of interest that the hybrid court and even the truth commission could begin to look at. But you know, it's an interesting debate that you have within the country because the one thing we found was the absence of really what we would call the kind of empirical data on which you need to do your work. And so in many ways, you use, you use the, the reports that have come out both from the Human Rights Division, from INGOs as a basis really to begin your work. But that means then that you begin to engage in investigations in a very different way. And of course, in speaking to the local population, this has had quite interesting dimensions because for many individuals, what they want to speak about is who did it to them. And what you really want to move away from is you want to understand who is operating in the area. Did they hear the name of commanders come up? What have they actually seen? And so in many ways, the commission has also become involved in educating many of the local NGOs who work on the ground around the difference between the human rights monitoring, but also being able to assist the commission, not with investigations or gathering information, but really to be able to give us some of the kind of details that we need so that we can begin our work. We've also been very fortunate in the sense that our military advisor has been an extraordinarily useful person because what he's been able to do is to actually go out and speak to the head of many of the peacekeeping missions, UNPAR people who have a better idea of who's been operating in a particular area. And so to some extent, we have in a sense based our initial work on the work being done by Human Rights Division people in local areas, but then we've come in and in fact have been able to lift it to a higher level. 
And I think that's an important difference that also looks to this question of how you collaborate with other actors who are on the ground. One of the things that we've also been really looking at is this question of what we would call the structural dimensions of the conflict. And in fact, if you look at South Sudan now, on the face of it at a national level, it kind of looks quite peaceful. But the moment you go to local level, you begin to see how something like cattle raiding into communal conflict at a localized level, in fact, more people are dying. And so that's another area that we're looking at in terms of these serious crimes. And then, of course, the big, the, the big newbie has been the question of economic crimes and really the diversion of um, the you know, revenues of the state, both non-oil -re revenue and, of course, the oil revenues. And why we looked at that is because when you begin to look at the socioeconomic rights dimension of the government's ability to deliver in terms of its obligations, that's not actually happening. So that's been an interesting question. Other questions around the collection and preservation of evidence, of course, the question of constructing a database. And this has been really difficult because in the Human Rights Council, it's not normally been something that the council has kind of had to deal with. And we went in and we said, can we have a special package which allows us to do the work like case matrix or data analysis, et cetera, which helps you to keep all of that information together. The other is constructing the question of chain of custody, because you can imagine in a country as diverse as South Sudan, you're actually doing a lot of this work after the fact. And so you really have to think ahead around that. And of course, the methodology to ensure that the chain of custody remains intact. And then, of course, we've had to consider this question of who has access to our information? Um, is it just going to be the prosecutor of the hybrid court? Or do we want other prosecutors in other jurisdictions who may take up these cases? And so the constructions of protocols to enable us to do that, of course, has also been an important feature of our work. And there, of course, we've collaborated with Catherine at the IIIM, so we can actually share, um, you know, how we walk this pathway. Um, I do think that um, the attitude of the local population, as we've begun to explain, the way in which we work has been quite interesting. And of course, both the African Union, IGAD, and civil society see the Commission of Inquiry as an important mechanism in the scheme of things, because we can go into issues that other people have not been able to articulate. We're also able to use the public role to engage with the government on issues. And, you know, I give you two examples with the escalation of sexual violence in Ye last year, with more than 150 women having been raped within the 10 day period is one of those issues. And of course, with the, um, the um, SPLM IO, we've done the same. Um, and have raised the question of one of the areas where the commanders would not release women. So it's been, I think, an interesting experience. It's novel, um, but at the same time, um, you know, what it has meant is also an, in, an enormous amount of advocacy and lobbying with member states, because South Sudan, after they signed the peace agreement, did argue in the Human Rights Council that they should be moved from a monitoring mandate to one on technical assistance. And so we had to say to member states, actually, if you want to move them, these are the benchmarks that you should use for yourself to make sure that you are not facilitating an escalation into possibly, um, you, know, you know, another terrain of atrocity crime. So I, I'll stop there, but I think it's been an interesting and an and involving experience of how to manage this kind of dual mandate. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, uh, Yasmin. I mean, and also it's interesting to see that just the, the, rig the rigor which goes into collecting evidence changes when you sort of shift from human rights monitoring yeah. into um, understanding what kind of atrocity crimes are being committed uh, by different parties. And it also becomes important to guarantee non-reference to think in terms of what are the power structures which are actually responsible for the commission of the atrocity crimes. So that was fantastic. Thank you so much. And now on to Rita.
Uh, Rita, since uh, you have served as a UN Special Rapporteur, and this sort of, your question really goes to the heart of what we're trying to get to in this event, is that since you've served as a UN Special Rapporteur on minority issues and are now on the committee on the elimination of racial discrimination, you have witnessed many countries where minorities are particularly vulnerable and or their rights are not legally protected under national law. From your experience, what differentiates cases where this results in human rights violation versus where minorities become a target of atrocities? So again, there's sort of tension between human rights violations versus atrocities. Thank you, Savita, and greetings to everybody. Both to my panelists, it's good to see you again, and of course the, the audience. And thank you for this very, well, complex and challenging question. I think, Savita, what you asked is, really something that we all want to understand. Because I think Castro said that there is no country which is free of human rights violation. It exists everywhere. Now the question is, what's the turning point when these human rights violations um, get into a level when we have to now face atrocity crimes? And I think it's a million dollar question because there are so many countries and situations and it's difficult to have, you know, like one good answer to this. Yeah. And also, um, there, is, there is so much literature out there, and I'm sure that also many of the, the people who listen to us are familiar with it. Castro mentioned their own framework analysis, but of course, um, CERD, my committee, has come up with a declaration on the prevention of genocide. And when I was a special reporter, I had my own report on how to prevent mass atrocity crimes. So there is already a, um, a lot of things out there that talk to us about the different indicators, triggers, the signs, you know, the early warnings. But I, I, I just try to think about my experience for this discussion today to really break it down to some very simple characteristics that I witnessed. And I'd like to share with you, um, at least I find four main elements that I think provide a fertile ground ground for atrocity crimes because of course they never come from a vacuum they come from a enabling environment and context so the first that i would like to say is i think it's necessary to have a fragile society where you have democracy rule of law and governance deficits now they come in different shapes and formats but it can be a legislative gap it can be big institutions it can be just pure leadership third termism so there must be already a, a big problem with deficits that exist in the country's leadership. Now, the second element that I would mention here is an unequal competition for territory resources and power. Because let's face it, there is not enough of these things in any country. And competition is a natural um, um, phenomenon. The problem is when it's unequal. When there are population groups or communities who are deliberately put in a disadvantaged position, say they feel that they are excluded from um, this, uh, this contest and competition. And this is when we see that communities start going against each other. And the third element goes hand in hand with, it, uh, with this, which is, in my opinion, a bias, politics and favoritism along ethnic or religious lines. It's when there is a clear pattern by the leadership to favor certain groups just because of who they are, <clears throat> because of their own identity. This has been very dangerous because again, it just creates this um, friction and the tensions among communities. And the fourth element that I would mention here is, as was also in your question, the minority rights and whether they are denied, violated or neglected. And here I would like to stop and say that I've been to missions in many countries and you know you really have to go through the legislation and the policies and the practice and I can say from this experience that many times this is a very tricky area because governments know how to adopt good laws. The higher you go the better the laws are. Constitutions are beautiful. Acts also can be really nice looking but then the, the, the devil, I mean the devil is in the details yes. how these are implemented and how they manifest in practice. And just to give you examples, in many countries, there is a guaranteed representation for minorities in the parliament. But when you look at the details, maybe all the minorities have to unite, they have to be on one party list, and they have a threshold which they can never hit. So on one hand, you have a nice law, on the other hand, it's impossible to actually enjoy it. But I also like to mention Cameroon, because I think many of us are um, 
very familiar with the situation in Cameroon and how it unfortunately escalated. When I was there on uh, mission, I was really um, impressed and I had to give credit to the, to the bilingual policies, you know, in education, in the media. I remember driving around the country and listening to a football game. Our driver was a, and my, <laughs> my assistant at the time was a big football fan. So we put on the match in the radio and the, and, the, and the car. And you know, five minutes in French, five minutes in English, five minutes in French, five minutes in English. So, you know, when you, when you face the situation first, it looked really um, encouraging. But then when I went to the English speaking region and, and Bamanda especially, this is when I understood that there's a lot of difficulties when it comes to holding powers. You know, the Anglophones said that they must speak French to uh, be successful. And even if they do, they, even from their own region, they can be excluded from positions. But they felt that for the Francophones, they don't have to speak English and they can even come to their region to be in a, in a power. So again, on paper, things look good. You look at the practice, it's very uh, alarming. And I would maybe separate one um, situation here, which, because you mentioned Myanmar. And we do have to stop here and just really remember that there are countries where there are discriminative laws on purpose. And statelessness is an issue. You know that in Myanmar, we had the 1982 citizenship law, but even in the Baltic states, there are many regions and countries where people are rendered stateless. And once you are stateless, you are in an extremely vulnerable position. So there are situations and there are laws that deliberately even if that was not the purpose, but by effect, they definitely put people in a, um, in a very hard, uh, impossible situations, and sometimes it's a full deprivation of rights. And so I also like to mention here the, the, the importance of the sense of belonging, because this comes back to the heart of why people feel that they are more or superior to others. And I think here we all know that Belonging is not about just taking up a physical space in a country. Belonging is much more. There are many elements to it. There is a sense of birth. There is a sense of dignity, a sense of equality and protection, community. So if you don't give this to all the population groups, naturally there will be communities who feel that they are over the others. And just to give you an example how I assess it, there are countries where no matter which ethnic group you come from, you are proud of your passport, right? When I was in Malaysia, the Indians, the Chinese, the Malays, they are all very proud of holding a Malaysian passport. Now, when I went to a mission in Iraq, it's not the same. You know, when you will go to the Kurdistan region, you're going to have a very different opinion about the national unity and whether people are proud to be Iraqis. So I think we have to watch out for societies where people feel that they are not necessarily belonging together. Because these are the societies where, which are really prone to divisions and then this can lead and, and escalate to atrocity crimes. And maybe my last thought here, not to, to avoid being too long, I'm happy that almost everybody mentioned the, the Sri Lanka Internal Review Panel in 2012. You know, I'm, I'm an independent UN expert, so I can be very criti critical of the UN system, and I have always been. And I took again this interview review panel some time ago to look at whether we actually have changed, you know, those uh, challenges and the concerns that were in the panel. And I just read you a few that really are important to me. First of all, the report said that the UN system lacks an adequate and shared sense of responsibility for human rights violations. It said that there was an incoherent internal UN crisis management structure which failed um, in, in response to early warnings. It talked about an ineffective dispersal of UN headquarters structures and coordination among UN agencies. Then it talked about a model for UN action in the field that was designed for development rather than conflict response. And then the fifth that I'd like to mention here was an inadequate political support from member states as a whole. And when you read this, I must say that I'm rather discouraged. I don't know how much we moved forward. We know that this led to um, the Human Rights Upfront Initiative. I'm happy we mentioned Jan Eliasson, but we also mentioned that it seems to be fading away. There seems to be a less interest and appetite to understand what it means. And I know Castro, you also said that it's not always 
the UN, which should be finger pointed to, because there are many actors, and I agree. But here on this panel, we all have something to do with the UN. We had, or we we ha we had in the past. We still have, or we will have. So I think it's also important to be just uh, doing a little bit of soul searching and ask ourselves whether we are really uh, bettering ourselves. And so, in that line, a very last thought, which I will just leave hanging. I won't address it in a response, but I just leave hanging is my concern about the uh, inclusivity of our own UN offices. And this is something that I have been talking about for a long time. It shocked me when I went to missions that sometimes I asked our very own UN colleagues in the country teams to show me where are the Quilombola communities in Brazil, where are the Batwa communities in Cameroon, or it doesn't matter, where are, you know, like the Roma communities in, in for example, in Iraq. Or, and it was, sometimes very discouraging that our colleagues had very little information about where vulnerable communities are. And I'm telling you why this makes me worried. Because it shows that we don't have an open and ongoing communication with these particular groups. So how the UN wants to prevent massachusetts to happen if we are not even in touch with those people who would need us more, almost. And so I was really worried that we are not encouraging members of disadvantaged communities to come to us and talk to us. Sometimes we don't know where they are. We have absolutely no channels open with them so that they can come and, and tell us in time, like, hey, I am being evicted. My community is being harassed. We have so many sexual abuse in our community by the military. If you don't have that trust already going on, like, how does the UN want to respond timely? Like, if we, if we still act as a fortress, if people don't even know how to knock at the door and come in, and they don't know which email to use or what phone line to use, how do we really want to claim that we are saving lives? And so, as I said, I'm, I leave it there hanging, and um, I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very heartfelt answer. And also, I mean, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, in the end, to explore what situations, you know, descend into atrocity crimes. I mean, we have to look. The devil is in the detail in terms of, and and I'm I'm particularly sort of um, impressed with the way you talked about belonging because you know how you alienate certain communities or certain minority groups depends on then how you will be, you know alienating them further by committing atrocities against them. So that's a, that's a really important point. Um, so, I mean, moving on, and I would like to ask you all to keep your answers short because we just have, we don't have that much time, but we want to get to a, a few more questions. Um, so this is to everyone. Um, how can, um, from your own experience, how can the international community prevent atrocities? How can we do a better job? I mean, we have identified some of the challenges We've also identified both Andrew uh, and Castro and Yasmin and all of you sort of also identified some positive uh, uh, things in terms of messaging, in terms of um, coordination um, in policy responses, I mean, as, as some of the ways. But in your personal experience, how do you think that the international community can do a better job? And could you answer this question in the context of the roles you have played with the union? Andrew, you want to go first? Not especially, but I will. So, I, so an answer to that, I am, um, the international community, I mean, let, let's be realistic about the international community right now. The, the supreme body that's meant to, to encapsulate the international glory, international community in all its glory or non-glory is the Security Council. And that is composed, as we know, 15 members, five permanent members, three of whom at the moment, not always, but at the moment, are ready to tolerate and not take any action against atrocity crimes unless they believe it is in their specific national or more, more often their individual political interest to do so. And actually, I would go further than that. Not only are three permanent members ready to tolerate atrocity crimes, they are ready to encourage atrocity crimes and certainly to shield the perpetrators of atrocity crimes from even criticism, let alone sanctions, should they believe it's in their national or political interest to do so. So in this situation, and it's not always been like this, I was in the UN for 30 years, and for much of the time, one would not have characterized 
the Security Council in those terms. But at, in moments like this, when the Russians have clearly said, for example, that they will not tolerate, I, I've been in sort of area meetings where they have said, they will never ever allow an international tribunal or mechanism to be established again, they, they will veto it. When, I need to tell you what the Chinese are doing at the moment or what the Americans are allowing to happen in areas where they have influence. So to talk, even to talk about an international community is, is, is actually not very realistic at the moment. So I mean, what members of the international community can do is perhaps not to even think about the Security Council at the moment, but to try and see what other coalitions, the EU obviously, although they have other problems to think about at the moment, and, in, and areas and other countries who might be ready to take action. So I, I, I do think one has to take it out of the UN, at the, hopefully this will change, but right now let's at least understand the realities of that. In terms of uh, your question of uh, what, am, what are we doing now, what am I doing in our individual capacity? Well, I, I've, now that I'm not in the UN, I, work, I had an organization in Germany, in Berlin, called the Berkhoff Foundation, which works on behind the scenes mediation and sort of grassroots peace building. So it's not so much, what we're trying to do there is not so much public advocacy, which is what I used to do in my old job and what I'm currently doing right now in this sort of meeting. But it, it's, it's working behind the scenes and trying to encourage the parties to work together and, that, and thereby be less likely to carry out atrocities. So it's a very different type of job from the public advocacy that Yasmin and Rita do and in some respects I did, but it, it's, still, it's still equally valid in my view. Thank you very much. Who, who wants to jump in next? Rita, you want to go next? Maybe just one message that I picked up from your last webinar <laughs> that you moderated. <laughs> <laughs> because it was about um, international criminal justice. And what, I, what impressed me during that discussion is how the panelists also focused on the positives of the civil society contributions to the mechanisms. And I think this is something as a positive when it comes to how do we share the tasks, how we act together. I think you do need to acknowledge that there is a very active civil society out there, which is now holding, you know, perpetrators accountable and are advocating. So where we see that maybe the appetite of member states and, and the member states within multilateral bodies is somehow, um, well, shrinking when it comes to um, human rights uh, protection, I think we also need to acknowledge that uh, fortunately there are more and more civil society uh, people who are working with us, um, with the international actors. And so I am not completely discouraged because I think once we, the UN and the grassroots level works together, you know, we can have that pressure making tool over governments, but it has to come from bottom up and it has to come from top down and then when you create that at the same time all this questioning all this checking all this monitoring and if you just make governments feel that they are being watched I think it makes a, a lot of difference and maybe just one little example there was once a community which was evicted from their own land and I was there and one year and a few years later they called me because they remembered my card and all I did was sending a letter to the respective government and they could move back to their, you know, to the territory. So sometimes it's just like a little contact between one person who's an activist and then you who sit in the UN and one letter can make a difference. I'm not saying that this is a common, um, unfortunately it's not a very common practice, but it happens. So I think we just need to go hand in hand and we have to work with the activists together. And then I, I see hope at the, and, and the light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> Thanks. Gastro, Yasmin, who wants to go next? Yasmin, please go ahead. Yasmin, please go yeah. fast. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I really enjoyed all of the comments and Rita's particularly, I think that in many ways, what we are also seeing is the way in which membership, member states are really shaping interests of both the Security Council and the Human Rights Council. And so um, the mechanism of last resort almost is the General Assembly. And I think that many, uh, you know, many bodies that normally do human rights monitoring are finding themselves in a bind and that bind is around whether or not you 
take on a technical capacity mandate as opposed to human rights monitoring. And of course, the implications for that means that you can open up an office in a country, your people can stay. Otherwise, what you risk also every time you speak out is the question of being PNG'd or losing your status completely. And so that paralysis, I think, what it's creating is really, I think, an extraordinary imbalance in the human rights situation because in, in, in effect, what we expect commissions of inquiry and the special procedures mandate holders to do is to fill that gap. And so we're the ones who go out and do the work, we speak out with a number of the INGOs. And then of course we find ourselves having to lobby for these mechanisms to take action on our reports. And we also find, I think we, we also find ourselves often on the back foot having to deal with the institutional um, infrastructure and framework as well. So I do think that the question of resources, the question of the gaps with the UN not speaking out on critical issues, I think is beginning to affect the paradigm in which we live. I don't think it's in a homogenous group. And I think that what we've got to look at are where are these gaps, on, uh, you know, where are the gaps. I do think that the second big problem for me is the lack of, action around dealing with impunity and you know dealing with prevention and mass atrocity crimes requires that you focus on criminal accountability mechanisms there is no real deterrent but that unless you take those who are the most responsible out of action the others need to see that this is happening and in the absence of that I think what you're saying is that they have carte blanche to get themselves another seat at the table, more rounds of peace negotiations, and more, in fact, they're cementing their opportunities to be in the new government when they then become untouchable. And so I, I think this question of impunity is really um, a big one. Then, you know, my, my last point is really around, um, you know, in, in the context of the Commission on South Sudan, one of the other mandates we have, and we have so many, is the question of facilitating the transitional justice um, initiatives. And what we've begun to argue is that, in fact, you need to see this not as a mechanistic process, but really to begin to envision what kind of society and country do you want to build? And what is the space particularly for those who have been marginalized? And it goes to the last element of what one would call the Joanne principles, the question of non-repetition, and really what Pablo de Graeff has described as what you want citizens to feel is the sense that they are citizens and that they can enjoy or place trust in the institutions of the state to work for them. And that's really the sort of high point. Do you feel included and are you able to claim your rights? And I think that goes hand in hand with this question of who are you and where do you belong? And I think if someone was to ask me what this question, why is South Sudan in the state that it is? It's a question we've, we, we've raised with the government. Do South Sudanese see themselves as having a unique South Sudanese identity? Or is that something that's been neglected in the, you know, the endless ongoing conflict, which is really taken on ethnic lines? So, I think that if you want to deal with mass atrocity crimes, there can be no excuse but to deal with it from an accountability framework. Thank you. Thank you very much. Castro. Uh, hi, Savita. Thank you very much. And thanks to the panelists. They, they have made the main point. Uh, but what can the international community do better? I think the international community is anchored in multilateralism. Okay, and we are at a stage where there's that broken promise to the people for this international community to provide the protection that is required. So my first point is everybody to step back and look at this multilateralism and this multilateral institutions and how do we hold them accountable for what they stand for. You know, the UN was established by saying, we the people, to save succeeding generations from the scorch of war. 
But then the UN is made of government and the actions, even when the UN goes in to protect people, it starts talking to the government. And the government sometimes, like in South Sudan, in Accra, and uh, DRC, and other places, sometimes we have seen it's the perpetrator, leading to the common person to say, what is happening to multilateralism? How can I ask you to come to protect me? And you are received by the foreign minister. You are received by the government official. You are being directed by that institution itself. So th there has been a, a broken promise. You know, if you look at it, you know, all the, the, uh, the expressions even around the table is like, how do we strengthen this multilateralism? I think it's very, very important. Uh, and, and I'm not saying like it's not, you know, it's important that even that finger pointing to the United Nations, the civil society can play a very strong role, you know, academicians and civil society to point out the weaknesses of what the United Nations is doing, the weaknesses of what the regional organizations are doing. You know, we have got very elaborate uh, mechanisms, laws, treaties, as, as Rita has said. You know, if you look at the papers and, and the laws of member states, regional mechanisms, the UN, they're very elaborate to protect people and we should not be seeing what it is. But how do we hold them accountable? You know, I, I, sometimes I go to Addis and ask people, you are really critical of the International Criminal Court. You rushed to, you know, uh, Libreville and established an African court, criminal court, and added some, in fact, the ICC has got only five crimes. You, you went ahead and put 14 crimes. Okay, what the heck are you doing? Whom have you held accountable? But, you know, it's not just me. I, I speak also as a citizen of that place, of, of that continent, that the civil society, that, that the, the, the citizens of that continent should be holding these institutions in the McLaughlin's in accountable. How effective is the African Commission for Human and People's Rights? It has a court system. They went in South Sudan, Yasmin. The East African community, when it, the leaders of that region were indicted by the ICC, they rushed to the East African community and created a criminal jurisdiction. Are they holding South Sudanese who are actually, they signed the treaty of the East African community in a record week time. All protocols signed as Rita, you have said. Have we held one person accountable? So when I speak of the faith in multilateralism, I'm not just referring to the UN, but there is a whole range of, if you look at the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights and how migrants are being treated uh, around the border and what are we doing? If you look at the European Court and then you look at how the refugees um, and, and migrants are treated in Europe, what is happening? You know, we lose faith in multilateralism. We have to rebuild that. Then the last point Rita would like just to make, which colleagues have referred to very often, is the question of accountability. Yes, you know, absolutely, yes, me. We have to make sure that accountability, you know, the work you're doing on South Sudan is great. I believe that, you know, the wheel of justice turns very slow, very slow. Sometimes it's very frustrating, but it runs deep. A few years ago, when I was a young diplomat in Sudan and I was in the Human Rights uh, Committee of the Third Committee, and we endorsed the, the findings of the Commission of the Inquiry, in 2004, and Bashir was indicted and was referred to, to the ICT. And everybody said, this is a political thing, and, and, and there has been a whole sort of condemnation using that as a classical case why referrals are not work. It's very interesting today, everybody saying, and even Kuyashev himself turning you know, himself over to the ICT. So don't despair. You know, if there is any opportunity for us to push for accountability, indict people, name those people in your report who are culpable, both as you have said, individual criminal responsibility and command responsibility, let's do it. Because at one time, as much as this will is turning very slow, we will see it happen. So I think fighting impunity, should, if we are to deal with atrocity crimes, civil society, the global center, we have to put it up there. You have, to, you have to go to the regional member states themselves. You have to go to the regional mechanisms and say we have to deal with this. 
the final point, uh, which I, you know, I just want to, to wrap up with, is, is that the other very key uh, uh, actors in terms of prevention, you know, and, and protecting, and these are donor partners, you know. Looking the other side and just focusing on development, you know, when we were saying in Juba many years, even before 2013, that just building roads and saying how much Juba is one of the fastest growing cities in the world, uh, is, it's not necessarily what an ordinary South Sudan that doesn't have water, education, basic needs wants. It's not that highway. So stop telling me how many kilometers of, of, of tarmac you have put there, you know, and, and, and it has come. You know, like, look at what is happening. You know, you, you, so when we talk to uh, donors and, and, and the development partners, we must tell them that, you know, it should be also people focused development. That like, what are you doing to the people? But, you know, sometimes we're so fixated with these grandiose projects uh, of economic indicators that do not take into consideration, you know, the quality of lives and, and the rights of the people themselves. And we just end up, um, are not doing much about it. So, you know, civil society, uh, academicians, individual activists, I think they have to touch on this point, but also hold everybody accountable because who are the main actors? The United Nations, regional organizations and mechanisms, of course, member states themselves. And even, you know, we have to go to the Security Council and all the time say, you will know that you're not going to do anything, but do not pretend you don't know what is happening. Now, that way, you know, at least you are exposing what this is, and possibly we can uh, build this broken promise of multilateralism uh, in these current times and, and, and see that possibly there's more attraction um, towards action on itself. Uh, it's very interesting, Andrew, when you mentioned the divisions between P2, P3. The, the dynamics are so interesting right now that there are divisions between the P3 themselves you know, crisscrossing between the P2 and P3 on Cameroon, you know. I'm sorry, the UK can't see itself in France on, 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 on this issue, you know. So we, we have to do something about that. Over to you, Sadita. Thank you. No, thank you very uh, one, much. One second, Sadita. Absolutely. I'll, I'll, I'll come back because Rita, Andrew, and Yasmin mentioned where is human rights are for the initiative. I think I'm a UN official, I, I, I'm here. I think it's important to, to quickly maybe use a half a minute to say, you know, of course, under Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, Andrew, you know very well, the Afro, Human Rights Afro Initiative was up there and Andrew was in that office and was very instrumental on this. Of course, um, the, the new Secretary General, you know, uh, Antonio Guterres has many times said, the Human Rights Afro Initiative, it's not that he has done away with it. He has restructured it in a way that it has to bring what was previously uncoordinated UN approach into what he calls the deputies committee and the executive committee, bringing the human rights as a key member of these entities, the development part, the humanitarian part, and the political side as the standing members and every week to look at situations that nobody is even talking about, that they're not the Security Council. That is where the Human Rights Upfront Initiative is doing. Is it as effective as we would want it to do? Possibly not. So, you know, you have to keep on pointing out how we can do this better. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And uh, uh, I mean, this was a very rich answer. I mean, you know, from Andrew saying that you have to look beyond the Security Council, you have to look at uh, unusual suspects to regional organization. Uh, Rita pointed out and also cast for the role of civil society. Yasmin mentioned that too. The role of justice holding perpetrators accountable and sort of also the role of citizens and individuals uh, in terms of raising their voice to, um, to safeguard norms that have, you know, helped civilize us. So from international humanitarian law to uh, international human rights law, um, you know, the, the commitments made around the refugee convention. So all of those norms, it's very important for us as citizens, as civil society people um, to defend them. We are completely out of time and I really don't have any more um, time to take any questions but you know just to end on a positive note if you can just take one minute or two minutes each um, and we have a question from Josephine Mittag from Denmark who says that can you give examples of where development assistance for human rights or assistance for judicial or security sector reform has lowered the risk for atrocities? 
So if there's very quick, I mean, you know, Rita, you mentioned that letter you wrote. So if there's a very quick something that you have to say, and if you can say that in terms of your concluding remarks, then that would be fantastic. Just to sort of ending it on a glass half full kind of a note where things have changed because of something that you or your office or the UN or a regional organization has done. Can I go first? Yes, please. Okay, quickly, you know, I mentioned this. So we have the background. We have the Gambia on the brink of committing atrocity crimes. Um, and, and everybody very worried of, of what is going to happen over there. The amount of support that have gone towards that country to come to the point that is representing a multilateral organization on a very important case that is far removed from the African continent is something that can inspire us, something that can actually tell us you know, when there are serious human rights violations, very far places, we are all united in humanity and we need to act. So you have this little place called the Gambia, somewhere in Africa, very tiny African country, just a few years ago was on the brink of atrocity crimes. It has a serious record of human rights violations, but now it has produced the, of course, the chief prosecutor of the ICC. It is speaking very boldly about accountability for past crimes just at home, on the continent, but on the international stage. And if you look at what the size per capita in all ways of the Gambia, it, it can draw inspiration to us without casting any aspirations in time or without giving any opinions as what will be the outcome uh, of, of the case. Uh, but that action itself, that we're gonna go and find out what happened in Myanmar, and we're gonna ask Myanmar whether it's adhering to the International Convention on Prevention and Punishment of Genocide. It's really something that all member states should look at themselves, especially the big ones, especially those that say we are developed, we, we uphold human rights and whatever. Yeah, you know, look at Gambia. So let's do something about it. We can do something, however small you are and wherever far removed corner you are, individual label, member state, regional organization, you can do something even in far away. Thank you. Thank you. Who wants to go next? Yes, ma'am, why don't you go next? Thank you. I mean, I, I was going to say just an example from South Sudan. We would not be able to do our work was it not for civil society actors. And of course, the fact that we one of the few commissions who have what I would call unfettered access to both the country and the region. And quite recently, this week, in fact, the um, head of the AU Commission on Human Rights and civil society have drafted a petition to the African Union asking them why they have not yet set up the hybrid court. So they're really challenging the regional mechanism because at the end of the day, the African Union has been mandated by member states to set up the hybrid court. And as the commission has argued, they have the ability in terms of the peace agreement to actually do it alone if the government doesn't come along and ready to deal with the questions of cooperation later. So I think it speaks to this question of agency that if we in fact build the agency of civil society actors, they can be quite a powerful force for change and they can compel the regional instruments like the African Union Commission to actually act in a way which is quite forceful. And I'm reminded of what Castro said that um, you know, African member states were very quick to develop a protocol. But if you look at the question of how many of them have signed on to a protocol which gives not only themselves as head of state's immunity, but also senior officials, you can see why there's the need for an international criminal court to exist. Thank you. Thank you very much. Andrew. Thank you. I, yes, on a note of positive, I, by the way, I fully agree with Castro's point on Gambia and Yasmin's point on civil society. Um, I would just like to say that for me, this, the single sort of beacon of hope on the, on the agenda, on this horizon is people's power. We, we saw that obviously with youth movements on climate change, but in the last year, we have seen major, major demonstrations of people, sometimes with incredible bravery when faced as in China, as in Hong Kong or the United States against horrific police brutality, people standing up. And we saw 
the, the best thing that happened to me in 2019 was watching Sudan, that the, the terrible regime uh, giving way to, to people's power. And um, Ethiopia, Chile, there are many places. So that, at, at a time, and of course, I, I was pretty negative right, um, about the Security Council, but, it, but at least we are seeing progress. And, uh, and one cannot say strongly enough how brave it is. It, it, it's not like doing it in, in, in countries where there isn't police brutality. Doing it where demonstrators know they're going to suffer terrible, terrible retribution is, a, is, a, is something that can only inspire the rest of us. Thank you very much. And Rita, over to you for, your, for the last word. Yeah, thank you so much. I think that I, there are indeed uh, good signs and hopes. But you know, in our work, when we, when we focus on prevention, we always say that it's impossible to measure our success. Because it's about prevention, we don't know whether things would have happened differently if he, if he had not been involved. So I think we have to be hopeful that whatever we do, the little steps are actually helping. I think there are a lot of uh, mechanisms and procedures that have, you know, the monitoring, the UPR, I think it does put pressure on member states. We witnessed that before a UPR review, they could be more welcoming to special procedures because they know that, you know, this is a time when they have to prove that they commit to human rights. So I think there are some good mechanisms, but if I may just change my hat from a UN human rights expert to a Roma rights advocate, because, you know, I come also from a minority group. And as a Roma rights activist myself, I might just say that I'm impressed how communities in this increasingly online world have started coming together. You know, I have regular meetings with other groups, you know, again, um, you know, groups uh, who are experiencing similar discrimination, you know, caste, um, uh, different uh, indigenous communities. So now we come together and we have a lot of brainstorming about how we, as Andrew said, how we claim this power that we have. And I think that this is unfortunate that we are operating now more and more in an online world, but I would also say that it also brings us together because I feel that now disadvantaged communities can really build a critical mass. Before we were left alone, if we were attacked, like if a Roma community was attacked, I remember 20 years ago, there was nowhere to go. You know, we were like on our own. But now I can contact my friends in the States, in the Philippines, and you know, we can all come together, issue a statement all together. So this is to talk, from a minority ad, um, activist perspective, that I also see hope in having that solidarity, this cross-community solidarity, which is really growing. And I see a lot of uh, chances for, for each other to become stronger and more united because of these new tools that are also there for us. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very, very interesting discussion. I think that we could go on for the entire day if we could, because there's so many issues to unpack. And given your experience and you know, your immense knowledge. I mean, it was such a pleasure to uh, talk to you this morning. Um, uh, thank you again for joining us. I would also like to take this moment to thank my team, um, Sarah Hunter, um, Jahan Pitalwala, Jacqueline Straitman Hall, and Julia Tawa for making this possible. Thank you again all for joining us and thank you so much for all our audiences who very patiently listened to us and I hope they learned as much as I did from the conversation. I just want to end on, you know, power to the people, people's power. And I hope I see you all very soon. Stay safe, stay healthy, and have a very good day, wherever you are.